Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. Joel, good to see you again. Good to see you, Matt. It's wonderful to be with you. I'm struggling. Like when I saw you in the hallway of the, the hallowed halls of Congress, <laughs> you had a jacket and a tie on, and I'm like, this guy looks familiar, but I'm not sure who that is. Yeah, these are my town clothes. <laughs> yeah. So you um, you survived. Is this the first time you've testified before Congress? No, it's the it second time, actually. I did one about, I don't know, I'm trying to think 12, 13 years ago. If you'll recall that uh, that cow in California at the slaughterhouse that went down and an uh, undercover, like humane society guy took pictures of him, uh, jabbing her with the uh, uh, for loader forks and then fire hosing her to try to get her to stand up long enough to 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 go in the knock box to be uh, slaughtered, and uh, Congressman Dennis Kucinich, at that time convened a a hearing on what's wrong with you know, the, the slaughterhouse industry in the U.S. And I was one of 12 that uh, testified then. And um, I don't think anything came of it. But uh, anyway. But you were was, brave enough to come back it, it, it for was, a it second. Was, it was interesting. Yeah. 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 So this was uh, today, the, the hearing today was called Where's the Beef? Right. And um, I never thought I'd say this, but subcommittee chairman Thomas Massey, I never thought he'd be a subcommittee chairman. Right. Um, and it's... Uh, Administrative state, um, and I trust whatever that is of the, of the Judiciary Committee, and and he hosted a hearing about his favorite issue and perhaps your favorite issue, which is the the centralization of the the meat processing industrial complex, right. as I like to call it. Um, what what was your impression? Did do you think you made any progress today, um, speaking to members of Congress? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Mark Twain used to say. Um, uh, voting voting can't make any difference. If it did, they wouldn't let us do it. <laughs> and and sometimes I think these hearings are like that too. You know, it's a uh, it, it's a procedure. But uh, bless his heart, uh, Thomas Massey for for convening what he did there and giving um, giving a voice to something that obviously doesn't normally get heard in, in D.C. Uh, did we make a difference? Well, you know, time will tell. But uh, but certainly I think our stories got out and. Um, and whether you and for those who agree, I think we gave them a little bit of ammunition. And those who don't, well, you know, we at least um, challenged. I think a little bit of their uh, preconceptions. Yeah, Thomas has done a very good job. The one thing that he's good at is he's able to to speak to people across the aisle, um, and he he argues it's because everyone knows where he's coming from, mm -hmm. and he's not being a partisan. He's never a partisan. He's always got his philosophical basis for what he does and he has managed to make the prime act which which basically legalizes local food is the way I think about it um, he, he does have um, some Democrats on his side and there there was at least one guy I don't remember his name but one guy today was like you know I'm actually curious now this sounds interesting to me so mm -hmm. so maybe some but there was and, and we'll get into this, but there was there was also this sort of robotic partisanship yes. mm -hmm. um, on that. But what is what is the issue with meat production in the United States? Let's give people a summary because I know we've talked about this yeah. before, but I want people to know what we're talking about. Well, the the issue is that you can you can pull off on any wide place in the road in the U.S. and sell cucumbers and squash and green beans, so uh, and mm -hmm. apples and pears and peaches and. Uh, grapes. So, so there's really no regulation to produce, which is why it it dominates farmers markets. It dominates local food systems. It 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 it, it dominates all that because it's it's a relatively unregulated thing. But as soon as you get into meat, poultry, and dairy, the animal component, which actually comprises half of the average consumer dollar. So roughly half of it is to animal protein, 25% 25, 25 of it is to dry goods like, you know, flour and sugar and salt. And then 25% of it is to produce, you know, veggies and fruits and things. Um, obviously the lion's share of not only the, the grocery budget, but the lion's share of land use is, is around animals. And that's what's regulated uh, 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 stringently. And... And so that's why 
the you know the, the animal protein uh, component is overly expensive. It's overly centralized, um, and it's overly um, it, 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 it's less accessible from a local food standpoint than any of the others. You taught me this the last time we did a show together, which in my memory was April, May of 2020, the, the year that everything ended. <laughs> yeah. And um, you corrected me, and, and I've, I've thought about it ever since because I was thinking about the supply chain when it comes to food as this incredibly decentralized um, um, process that they were, they were disrupting with, with lockdown orders and everything else. And you said, well, wait a minute, um, I, th- I think it's a very centralized mm-hmm. and, and brittle system, particularly yes. when it comes to meat processing. Uh, yes. What did you mean? Well, what I meant was that there are roughly um, 300 processing facilities that are the, the conduit, the funnel, for 85% of America's animal protein supply. Um, you know, 300 mega companies, let me say. And... And so when you have that much concentration uh, where, you know, where that much stuff has to go through, you know, one channel, if there's a blockage in that channel, there's a massive uh, effect throughout the, throughout the industry. I mean, the question I always ask people, it's, it's, so, it's so obvious, it's rhetorical. It's would we have had a big, uh, as big a hiccup in May of 2020 in the, in the, food supply with empty, you know, supermarket shelves and stuff. If we had had 300,000, you know, community-based, uh, smaller scale processing facilities as the conduit of animal proteins into the marketplace, would we have had less of a hiccup than, than having only 300? And, you know, this is, you don't have to be a Democrat or a Republican to realize intuitively, yeah, if we'd have had 300,000, uh, absolutely, we would have been able to adjust easier because, you know, uh, when there are when there are disruptions in the system, when you're navigating rocky shoals, you don't want to be in an aircraft carrier. You want to be in a speedboat. Yeah. And and so, you know, speedboats are able to navigate those those uh, difficult waters. Decentralized local knowledge. It's a it's a thing. A- absolutely. De- decentralization, uh, uh, democratization of access. I mean, look. If you're running a, a 5,000 employee mega processing facility, which is what these are, it's remember, it's, it's cold, it's dark, it's damp, 5,000 people in there. Um, that's like an incubator for viruses. For, I don't want to get in a big debate about you know, the legitimacy of COVID and all that, but, right. but, but that, that is, a, that is a, an environment that's conducive to bacterial, viral, pathogenic growth. And, um, and, and so if you run a very small plant and you're not running around the clock and you don't have um, the amount of guts and blood and hair and feathers and whatever, you know, on the floor, scale, scale is, is, is a thing. It just is a thing. And yeah. I'm not opposed to, you know, to, to business size uh, inherently. But, but you know, uh, when you come to biology, it's not just a mechanical manufacturing plant. There are actually living bacteria and, and salmonella, and eco- there, there are living things in there. Yeah. It's not just widgets in a, in a, Ford, in a Ford plant. Big, big difference between just inanimate mechanical stuff and animate biological stuff. Very, yeah. very different. There was, I don't remember the name of the company, but there was a massive pork processing facility where there was a big outbreak in COVID. I think it must have been in Iowa. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that was a key part of the supply disruption chain because they had to shut it down, as I recall. Is that? Yes, they shut it down. And then, yeah, I mean, I mean, when you've got that many people uh, crammed in a place, just the chances of contagion is so much greater than if you only have... 20 employees or 25, you know, and, and you've got way more square footage per person and they're moving around. There's more light, you know, it's just more airflow per whatever. Uh, and the, the worst part of all that, well, they shut down. Well, then farmers that were producing for this pipeline didn't have anywhere to go. And so they, end up, they ended up exterminating, you know, uh, 
thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of pigs and poultry. Cattle, not so much because it's a little longer horizon. You know, you can, you know, there's a little bit of cushion there because the cow's longer. But pigs and poultry, you know, it's a, it's a much shorter um, production to processing uh, trajectory. And uh, as a result, there's a lot less forgiveness. And so, you know, the industry says, you know, euthanasia. No, it's not euthanasia. Euthanasia is when somebody's something sick and you put it out of its misery. There was nothing sick about all these animals. That's extermination. Uh, they exterminated them, didn't euthanize them. Yeah. If you're watching this show, you're probably wondering, is there a way I can support liberty and improve my life at the same time? Well, there is. Pack Crest Botanicals is a libertarian-owned company that makes botanical CBD products. I started using CBD oil to help me when I'm trying to sleep, and my three annoying cats won't leave me alone. Now I can just ignore them for a solid eight hours and wake up feeling great. Not only are they run by our friends in the Liberty Movement, Pack Crest Botanicals also uses high quality organic ingredients in everything they make. They sell tinctures, edibles, topicals, and botanical vapes. CBD oil can help with pain, insomnia, inflammation, anxiety, stress, arthritis, and more. Use discount code FREETHEPEOPLE to save 25% of your order. And if you select Free the People as your charitable organization at checkout, a portion of your purchase will be donated to us to help fight for freedom. Wildly irrational, and, I, and that seems like a nice segue to talk about this hearing because there, there was some sort of bipartisan understanding that we've that we have this centralized system yeah. that that proved to be quite fragile during during covid and the lockdowns um, but there didn't seem to be any recognition and recognition of what i would call regulatory capture <laughs> like there's higher and higher levels of of technical detailed regulation on food safety and and we all believe in food safety um, I've yet to meet a single person eating dinner that right. doesn't want food safety. Right. Um, but they didn't seem to comprehend that layers and layers of, of legal compliance might, in fact, centralize a system that was 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 very much characterized by all sides at this hearing as a cartel. Right. Like it's or, or even or even uh, not only centralized but even impede food safety. Yeah. Um, is is that possible? Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. And that, that, that's one question that, that I didn't think um, your side was able to make much progress on, explaining mm -hmm. the power of localism when it comes to accountability and food safety. And, and you tell this great story about a hamburger. Start with that. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so a hamburger has pieces of 600 animals in it. And... Um, and there's no way in the world that you can tell where those animals came from. You don't know wh wh what they were. Um, all the because it's been processed in a centralized way. Yeah, because it's been processed in a centralized way. I mean, the the the, the people who love regulation, you know, they're quick to say, uh, well, if you know, if, if we allow uninspected meat in in the in the marketplace, well, we won't be able to know if somebody gets sick. Well, where did it come from? Well, they know where it came from. Um, and as if, as if the 600 animals in one burger, um, that the, their system knows where it came from. No, they don't have a clue where that came from. And so it's this, it's this complete, it's this faith. It's this, this almost blind faith in a, in a system that's actually, that actually doesn't accomplish anything. They, they think it accomplishes something, but it, it actually doesn't accomplish much. And, and yeah, that, that, that was the most frustrating part uh, of the hearing. We, we all agreed we're too centralized, we, we, and, and everybody agreed we want to preserve choice. The problem is how do you get there? Yeah. And, and, uh, and you know, I say that we, we got there, two, two things, and, and one of the things I had written down, and, and you know, the question didn't come, so I didn't, I didn't get to it uh, toward the end, but um, one reason we've gotten here is because the regulations have put so many small, uh, small process, processing facilities out of business. But the second thing we gotta understand with part of the centralization is the, um, uh, is the complicitness uh, of the consuming public who 
during this period of time from you know 1950 to to let's just say 2000 until the kind of local food movement got traction um, for that period of time I was in a love affair with TV dinners and lunchables and hot pockets and 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 centralized uh, highly processed foods I mean even uh, even calling breastfeeding barbarian and Neanderthal. Um, and, and so it wasn't until kind of the hippie, the hippie wake up movement, beaded, bearded, braless, you know, revolution, that, that the culture began returning. There, there, be, there began to be a yearning back to roots, back to connectedness, you know, uh, Lamaze, um, uh, dads that wanted to see the birth uh, and help and breathe and you know I, I mean this was all part of a of a culture that had been un completely unmoored um, returning to to something that's that's humanly connecting yeah Did and, and, and and so so the um, the culpability is what I'm getting at um, you know, if you're angry at the centralization and there was no meat and that you can't get good local food and all this, the part of the culpability here is the consuming public that, that, that built Tyson, that built these, you know, these big outfits through the 60s, 70s, and 80s until that pendulum finally swung up here uh, until now we have this kind of uh, desire, you know, the growth of farmers markets, the growth of, of, of local branding, and farmers uh, on farm stores and and all that sort of thing. I mean, I think I think definitely consumers are more informed today. But I wonder if it's kind of a chicken and an egg thing, if I could use a, a farm <laughs> analogy, because at that very same time, you're you're getting all of these new regulatory structures to protect food safety, and and I guarantee you that if you had been testifying at the ag committee, at the agriculture committee all of those vested interests that love yes. regulation because it, it, it centralizes their business and it destroys all the local um, smaller competitors. So I, I wonder if it started with the, the regulation that took those choices away from consumers or was it consumers looking for the, the ease of, of safety dinners? Probably both. Yeah, right? well, it's, it's both, but, but, but for sure, I think that in general, the regulatory structure was a response to consumer, you know, Ralph Nader, uh, uh, consumer advocates that said, you know, look, uh, people don't know, people don't understand, and so we need we need a a government intervention that's bigger than the biggest corporation we can imagine. You know, it's always this: we need something bigger uh, to create accountability within within the, the 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 corporate community. These these big bad business people, and uh, and, and so. So the, the impetus for this, and this is the problem with asking for government solutions. Uh, the impetus is always sincere, you know, heartfelt. I get it. Um, you know, I want security. I want protection. I want all this. But as soon as you ask the government to be the agent of that and you give up personal responsibility, vetting, basically you give up your own your own discernment, your own discernment muscles. Yeah, yeah. Okay. As soon as you give that over to the government, um, you, you, you've now created an inherently uh, um, corrupt and crony, crony directed, you know, and yeah, yeah. Crony direct. I mean, it is, it, 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 it is that way. That's why we have the revolving door, you know, um, People come out of the government and, and, and regulatory agencies and work for the corporate. And then they come, they retire from the corporate and go into the government. And, and it's just a revolving door. So, uh, so you, you, you don't have uh, the kind of checks and balances. And it doesn't get fixed by saying, well, if we just had better people down there. No, no. It, these systems are inherently uh, incentivized by human selfishness, greed, power, prestige, you know, all those base human elements, um, man, you know, wouldn't you love to have the power to walk into, you know, a, a business, a processing plant, say, I don't like that. I'm going to shut you down. I mean, that that just appeals to the basest human instinct you can imagine. And that's how these these regulatory agencies operate. Yeah. Have you ever thought about using CBD oil? You haven't? Well, think about it now. Are you thinking about it? Good. 
because now there's a way to support freedom and improve your life at the same time. Packcrest Botanicals is a libertarian-owned company that makes a wide variety of botanical CBD products. I use CBD oil to soothe the sore muscles I get from constantly fighting the man here in Washington, D.C. It's a tough job. Somebody's got to do it. Packcrest Botanicals uses high-quality organic ingredients in everything they make. And as libertarians, you won't have to worry about them hurting people or taking their stuff. They sell tinctures, edibles, topicals, and botanical vapes. CBD oil can help with pain, insomnia, inflammation, anxiety, stress, arthritis, and more. Use the discount code FREETHEPEOPLE to save 25% of your order. And if you select Free the People as your charitable organization at checkout, a portion of your purchase will be donated to help us keep fighting for freedom. And by the way, like there's there's no there's no agency on the consumer side when you sort of cede safety right. <laughs> to this to these faceless yeah. bureaucrats. So, I mean, right. you know some of these guys by name because you have to work mm-hmm. in the system. But um, if you actually did get an unsafe product, um, there there is no accountability because you you don't know who the decider was, and right. that that person is a is a nameless bureaucrat. And their solution, by the way, will be to hire more faceless bureaucrats. That's we, right. we didn't have enough resources to do it right. And, and, and hand you another stack of checklists yeah. for, you to, for you to check. Here's you some know, more forms. Check, yeah, here's some more forms. Check off. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's the solution. And that, that was the thing that was so frustrating about this hearing is that um, um, a number of Democrats um, specifically, they're the ones that spoke up, and maybe there were yeah. Republicans that felt the same way, um, didn't could not comprehend the power of face-to-face exchange and a right. farmer at a farmer market selling directly to the people in his community um, it's so obviously the safest way to do it to me but sure. that they could not comprehend that sure sure and to 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 think that a an intimate relational transaction cannot because of its intimacy and its relationship and its transparency, to think that that cannot compare to a bureaucratic checklist coming down from D.C. is just uh, is just ridiculous. And 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 the worst thing is that those folks who have their faith in that nameless, faceless, not opaque system are not even willing to give our side the chance to experiment to yeah. see to see. If a intimate, relational, small-scale, you know, a transparent transaction uh, can be safe or safer, uh, they don't even want to let that experiment happen, and that's that's the real uh, whatever you know uh, evil of 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 a committee hearing like this is that that the folks who who disagree with a more with with a a, a transparent kind of thing that that they can't even posit, well, let's let a state do an experiment if they want to. They can't even let that happen. Yeah. And that that's truly tragic. And like that, that it was even controversial, the idea that states with, with the same rules and the same right. regulations would, would have at least 50 centers of, of innovation. Yes. Um, and you tried, but you couldn't really get them to go full local. <laughs> and it, yeah. this to me, like, um, I, it's frustrating in Washington, D.C., but obviously everything in this town is about centralizing power. Yes. And we're going to have one standard, and we're going to have one set of rules, and we're going to enforce it um, by these, 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 these heartful bureaucrats that mm-hmm. really care more about us than, than we do. But I think more and more people, we were talking about this before we went live, I think more and more people, particularly after three years of, mm-hmm. of lockdowns and mandates and, mm-hmm. and school closures, are like, you know what, I... I need more control over my own life. I need to find something other than these faceless people deciding for me and my children how to live our lives. Yes. If, if there's one theme that I hear all the time now, it is, how do I disentangle? How do I disentangle? We saw it, we saw it in, the, in the revolution here in Northern Virginia with the education, with the last gubernatorial campaign. You know, uh, COVID got parents for the first time to see over their children's shoulders here what are you what are you learning and the parents went ballistic 
and 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 fortunately, there were there were options for those parents. There's you know private schools, charter schools, uh, correspondence schools, boarding schools. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of, of, of alternatives to the public school. And um, and during 2020, you know, a million children uh, came out of public schools, and many of those are never going to go back. Um, I mean, I can tell you, you know, in the last three weeks, I've spoken at the uh, Florida Parent Educators Association annual convention and the Home um, Home School Education Association of Virginia (HEVE). Both of those conferences in the last three weeks, and they are just they're just they have all doubled their membership in the last 12 months. I mean, it's just, it's just a, it's a going straight up. And, and, and there's an option. There, there's an option there for people. The, the, the problem is that with the prohibition for me to be able to sell you a T-bone steak, unless it's stamped, approved by a government agent, no option exists. If, if you would rather trust me as a farmer than trust a bureaucrat, you can't do it. I, I, I can't I can't sell that that opt out option because to you. because according to the feds that steak might be unsafe. That's right. That's but right. you can sell me that whole cow where that steak came from. Is that right? Can yes. You, can you I, sell me a cow? I, I can sell you the whole. The cow. The cow is safe. That's right. That's but, right. I can but sell the you steak the steak isn't safe. But the steak isn't safe. Not only that, I can give you a steak, and you can. Feed it to your children, or put it in a community potluck, and that's perfectly fine. It's only if you buy it. So what is it about exchanging money that suddenly turns a wonderful, uh, uh, you know, kind thing, giving you a steak, into a hazardous material just because we exchange money? So clearly, clearly. These regulations are not about food safety. They're about controlling market access. Now, I know all the people on the other side, oh, we know it's about food safety. About food. If it was really about food safety, I wouldn't even be able to give you. I can't give you cocaine. I can't give you, you know, um, uh, fentanyl or whatever it is. Okay. Every other hazardous substance that, that, that's deemed a hazardous substance in our society the prohibition is on both buyer and seller. You can't sell it and you can't buy it. You, in fact, you can't even possess it. But when it comes to food, all the prohibitions are only on the seller, yeah. not the buyer. Yeah. And I think this is the, 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 the revolution is so much bigger than just education. It's, it's, it's become this completely nonpartisan, independent driven idea that we're going to have more control over our lives, and that's that's part of that's the education of our kids. But um, what would be more intimate than the food that you put in front of your, front of your family? And, <laughs> that's right. And why can't you have a little bit of control over that? Yeah, I mean we, I mean we're we're in we're living in a in a cultural time of choice, right? Choice for abortion, choice for sexual identity, choice for marriages. You know, I mean, look, we've we've we worship at the altar of choice right now, and yet somehow nobody cares that that um, the government getting between my lips and my throat um, is an invasion of privacy. You know, oh, that's perfectly fine. We, don't, we, we can't allow that kind of choice. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's ludicrous, the, the hypocrisy and the inconsistency in the whole. Thing. I think there's got to be a link between the, the safetyism is what I would call it, because it's not about safety, but it's, a, it's almost a, a, a religious culty type yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. But if you were to follow the breadcrumbs, and if this was a <laughs> if this was a whodunit novel, we would go straight back to the big meat processing industrial complex, and them feeding that narrative because they want to they want to control us. Oh yeah, yeah. They they want to they want to point out that you know um, uh, small operators are not as sophisticated. They haven't been to you know, to, to butchery school or whatever, you know, they, uh, and, and, um, it, 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 their, their infrastructure is more crude. Uh, you know, they don't have the latest, greatest, whatever. Um, but you know, the, the truth is that, that at, at a smaller scale, it's easier 
to wipe down services. It's easier to keep things clean. It's easier to to ride herd on your employees and see who's who's clean and who's not, who's sick and who's not. Those kinds of things. Um, it, it, it's just way way simpler. And and again, our society does recognize scale on numerous levels. Um, you know, like in Virginia, we can have we can have three uh, three daycare children in our home without any regula- without daycare regulations. Why? Because if you've only got three, you know, chances are um, your you know your relationship with those three parents is so intimate and close. They see whether the house is junky or hazardous or you know unsafe, whatever. Uh, same thing for elder care. We can have three elder care and charge for. You know, three without any without any nursing home regulations. Uh, why? Because if you only have three, chances are the family's been in there. You know, they look around, they see they're coming for visits, and, and so you know we recognize scale on numerous things, realizing that that if you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna pick up a, a Sunday afternoon pick up touch football game with a bunch of you know kids in the in a backyard, you don't need to be in a professional st- uh, a professional NFL stadium with a with a professional referee, y- y- you have that freedom to, to do. And you know the ultimate the ultimate test of whether a society is heading toward tyranny or freedom is is how it responds to the to the dreams and the desires of people who want to control their own destiny, who want to opt out, who want to be be and do something unorthodox. Yeah. That's the ultimate test of freedom. At Kibbe on Liberty, freedom is a lifestyle 24-7, something you live and breathe and wear every day. If that describes you, you need the very best Liberty swag in the market today, just like this shirt I happen to be wearing. Go to freethepeople.org slash KOL and check out our exciting merch. You too can love Liberty and look cool. We talked about the, um, the the frailty of the supply chain in this centralized mm-hmm. system. Um, we, we talked about safety. The one thing that didn't really come out in the hearing, you p- touched on it at the <laughs> end, but what about, what about consumers that would love better, more affordable food? And I'm, I'm not even, I'm never inherently of economy, against economies of scale like right. if there are big right. producers that mm-hmm. are that are keeping people fed fed at an econ- yep. I'm having a hard time talking now yeah. <laughs> but but the thing that I think happens when you legalize food freedom is that you get you get more producers uh, smaller producers at the local level yep. um, and that is going to make better food more affordable for everybody because I think one of the yep. problems right now, if if you want to eat grass fed beef, if you want to eat something something more natural, and, and you know, God help us, if you want to know where it came from, <laughs> that's yeah. that's not cheap. No, it, it's not because it, of all these. It, it's these not barriers. cheap, and it's be, and and it's 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 uh, largely because of these prejudicial regulations. Um, the, the you know the plant that that I co own, you know, it co- it costs us about five hundred dollars. To do what um, you know, JBS, one of the big meat packers, um, does for a hundred dollars. Why? Because the the paperwork, the you know, we've we've got to have a a dedicated separate bathroom and office for the inspector. Well, um, you know that there's a certain cost to that. Yeah. And if we could only spread it over over you know uh, 30, 30 beef a week that's a lot of overhead over those animals versus versus a big plant that's doing you know 5000 animals a day they get to spread that over the same same thing is true with testing the same thing is true with 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 just everything through it it doesn't always um, scale easily you know it, if in order to make charcuterie I have to have a two thousand dollar thermometer, you know. That's a drop in the ocean if I'm making a tractor trailer load of charcuterie. But if I'm making a five gallon bucket full, suddenly that two thousand dollar thermometer just put me out of. I'm not even going to start. And so that's where the these impediments to entry. And and the thing is, all these guys, 
um, I mean, you know, I, I, I personally did stuff with uh, Bob Evans at Bob Evans restaurants. Um, and, and, and Tyson, I haven't personally done stuff with them, but, but if you read their story, Frank Perdue, all of these big outfits today started in the 40s and 50s from the tailgate of a pickup truck. None of those would have been legal in today's climate. So, so I'm not opposed to scale and growth and, and, and efficiency, economies of scale. I, I'm, I'm all for it. But, it but, but when you don't preserve the ability for another, for another generation to also start on the bed of their pickup truck, that's when you get monopolies. Yeah. And yeah. that's what we saw today. The, 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 like the, the left loves to worry about the, and they did this today, they sure. were worried about this, the centralization and these mega yeah. food processing companies. And, um, you know, we worry about, you know, the right worries about um, too much too much government power. Mm -hmm. um, me as a libertarian, I worry about both because when they collude, Yes. Um, that's when you get these really dangerous, yeah. un unbreakable monopolies. Yeah, yeah you, you, you actually, um, I, I'm trying to remember the quotation, but some famous person basically said, and I'm paraphrasing, that, um, that you will never show me a monopoly that got there on its own. Every monopoly, oligarchy, got government, some sort of concessions, subsidies, uh, um, uh, regulatory you know, freebies, something, you know, zoning, whatever. But but they always got there with some sort of interventive government push, every, every one of them. Yeah. So I was telling you about this story that, that recently showed up in the New York Times. Of all places, the New York Times wrote what I would characterize as a puff piece about our friend Thomas Massey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and he actually refused to, to work with the reporter because <laughs> when the New York Times calls you, you don't. <laughs> You don't expect it to be friendly, right? Um, but it talked about him, and it well, even, unless you're Hunter Biden, yeah. Well, <laughs> you're, you're going to get a different. <laughs> let's, let's just let's just go brazenly that in that direction. We'll do a whole show on that. So Massey, uh, so we read this story, and and Massey is like, this is a really positive story. What uh -huh. what happened, and what they had done is they had lifted. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the things he said in the documentary we made about him off mm -hmm. the grid, mm -hmm. but more interesting, and, and the, the theme of the story was they had um, found comments on our YouTube page of people that discovered Massey and discovered off the grid lifestyle and discovered food freedom through watching the documentary, and they were coming from all over the place sure. ideologically. Sure. Mm -hmm. and, and the suggestion in this, even the New York Times got this, that there's a movement of people that are so frustrated with with being disconnected, are so frustrated with gray-suited, faceless bureaucrats telling them how to live their lives. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, was turbocharged by lockdowns. Yes. That there there is a revolution going on. And there is. it's not right, left, or center, or anything mm -hmm. else. It's just people using common sense again. That's right. Uh, I, I call it a homestead tsunami. It really is. There's a there's a uh, an intuitive deep sense that if the wheels are going to fall off, I don't want to be stuck in the city, a and I don't want some bureaucrat herding me in to to tell you know you need to go here for safe haven or security. I want to pick my own safe haven. I want to pick my own security. You mean you mean a COVID camp? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, I was just at the um, the Homestead Festival in Tennessee. I did a, a chicken butchering demonstration. Show them how to butcher a chicken. Had I don't know three or four hundred people there um, watching this, and asked for a show of hands. How many of you? How many of you, when you were a teenager, wanted to butcher a chicken? Uh, you know, we're, we're thinking about uh, self-reliance skills. In the whole crowd, three hands went up. Three hands. That shows how dead on, spot on you are about this is a relatively, this is this is a wave that COVID just, and, and you know what? If COVID uh, put wind in the sails of self-reliance, independent thinking, I'll make my own decisions, thank you very much. God bless it. You know, I'm glad that it came to actually, to actually put that many people, you know, 37% of Americans did not take the jab. 37%, now that's not half. 
probably now there's another 10% that wish they hadn't, maybe more. My point is that we might be in the 50% range of people that actually the next time whoever Fauci's replacement is steps up to the microphone, they're going to be newly... The COVID vaccinated them <laughs> from believing the next pontificate yeah. at the federal level. And that's a good thing. Yeah. I have to correct you, though. It wasn't COVID. It was the government's heavy-handed, one-size-fits-all, yeah. yeah. I don't give a damn about your life response right. to COVID, right, I think. Right. Absolutely. Was it. And, yeah, absolutely. And, and the, the vaccine mandates. Like, you're not allowed to work unless you make this choice. Yeah. It's not a choice or, or, at all. Or, or, or you're, you're not essential. I mean, what does it do to a person's psyche to, to tell you that, that what you've devoted your life to is not essential? Yeah. I mean, that, 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 that's emotionally dis, uh, uh, destructive. By, by the way, um, it's a little sidebar, <laughs> the Department of Homeland Security and some sub-sub-agency alphabet agency within Homeland Security was the agency in charge of deciding whether or not you were essential. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So I'm like, this this is everything that's wrong with everything we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. How could that faceless bureaucrat yeah. know whether or not your job is essential? Yeah. I mean, think about that. I, I've never actually thought about that until just the, when you said it. I mean, so did somebody actually have like like a big spreadsheet of, of things, you know, um, <laughs> Yeah, cow milker, uh, welder, uh, you know what, and, and just go at it and, and check. I mean, that's um, that's insane. Well, think think about it at the very local <laughs> level, and this is this would be like a critique of, of Soviet style central planning. <laughs> yeah. If if someone in Washington D.C. decides who you need to run your farm, right. and they're they have no idea how to run a farm, right? But they're they're going to create these categories, and then they're going to check some off and say those. Well, we got to have that guy, mm -hmm. and that, that was you know my original thinking about the, the 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 complexity of the supply chain is nobody knows how those vegetables get from that farm all the right. way to the Uber Eats bag that shows up on your front right. door while you're sheltering in place. Right, right, right. Um, right that's right. But that's writ large, that just created so much havoc. But again, like I, I shouldn't go down this rabbit hole because I think, <laughs> I think there's something beautiful happening here. Yeah. Because I think that, people exactly are waking right. up to the absurdity of that. And that's it's exactly not, right. it's not a political statement. It's yeah. just like, I, I yeah. need to take some responsibility. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so, so what's interesting, I, I mentioned Homestead Tsunami, um, which is actually the title of my next book, uh, coming out in September. But, uh, but, but the other thing about this is, so, so, what what um, the the catalyst to the trigger to make this happen was fear. Uh, people feared the city. They feared the lockdowns. They feared the the bureaucrats. They feared you know what they were hearing and fear. But fear does not keep something going. You you can't run away forever. At some point, you have to run toward something. You, you have to what what actually makes you um, I mean I mean look look at you I mean you so so you, you you fear you fear encroaching government blah 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 but what actually sustains you here is an embrace of individual freedom and honoring and respecting personal dreams and 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 opportunity okay and so so out of this yes I think, I think the whole COVID and all of its nuances um, did spawn a, a an incredible fear, and people began running away from something. But the homestead, the self reliance movement, is now there. There, well, I can't run. I, I need a destination. Oh, the destination yeah. is a backyard garden. Did you know that a million flocks of backyard chickens started in 2020? A million flocks of backyard chickens. I mean, if they're average of six, you know, I mean, it's, it's millions and millions of eggs a day. Uh, it, it, and, and it is still pretty much ongoing. Hatcheries are still uh, really crammed. I mean, that's just one example of people actually taking their destiny. And, and, and all these people that showed up to watch me butcher a chicken, you know, to learn how to do that. And that's, that's a very positive movement. And that then has, that has sustaining power because now 
We're not running away. We're embracing. We're embracing a whole new a thing so that so that we then are in a position to provide hope and help when society becomes hopeless and helpless. Yeah. And it might, in fact, stop society yes. from becoming hopeless yes, and helpless. Absolutely. absolutely. And, and I, what, what I love about it is I think, and I've always argued that um, my libertarianism is really just based on a couple things that my mom taught me. <laughs> and she was not a libertarian, but uh-huh. she was a smart mom. And she yeah. said, don't hurt people. Don't take their stuff. <laughs> yeah. Work hard. Yeah. Take yeah. responsibility mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and cooperate with your neighbors. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that's the entire homesteading moving that you're describing yeah. is, is just yeah. a return to um, basic values. I call them American values, but I think they're actually human values. Yeah, oh, absolutely. They're human values. They're, they are the values that have sustained civilization since there was civilization. And... and um, and, and the things that have destroyed civilizations have been the opposite. Um, not being friendly to your neighbor, taking people's stuff, uh, you know, all those kinds of things. Yeah. So the new book comes out in September. Right. Um, what else do you have cooking that we need to know about? <laughs> what else do we have cooking? Um, uh, See another, f- another food reference there for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so one of the things that, that 220 started for us was um, we began hosting gatherings at the farm. So we just hosted this spring the Rogue Food Conference um, gathering, and um, we've got a, a, um, a Two Days of Truth Summit coming up all about what the medical community has told you that's untrue over the years and how to, how to uh, counteract I'm it. told that natural immunity doesn't matter. Is that true? Because <laughs> that's what the government told me. Yeah, yeah, no, I was, I, I so, I so wanted... Fauci to step up to the microphone and said, "Okay, America, we're gonna we're gonna do an experiment here. I don't know if this will work or not, but we'll, we'll do it for a month. It's, it's a month of long experiment would be cool. So for one month, uh, first of all, we're not we're not gonna drink any um, high fructose corn syrup uh, soft drinks, and uh, and we're gonna we're gonna cook from scratch. We're actually gonna eat uh, food that will uh, will decompose. We're not gonna have Velveeta squeezable cheese, Lunchables, and hot pockets. We're actually gonna eat you know." Uh, uh, food that'll that'll digest and compost, and um, and let's see, um, we're not getting enough sleep, so let's all get eight hours of sleep a night. Let's do that for a month, and um, and let let's you know uh, vitamin D, sun. It's really important. Let's get out in the sun for twenty minutes a day. Get some get some sun, you know. And oh, a uh, sweating, you know, that's a way to sweat toxins out of your body. So we're gonna sweat for twenty minutes a day. You can jog, you can work out in the gym, you can just run in place, whatever. But but we're gonna sweat for twenty minutes a day. And um, and uh, let's see what else. Oh, water. You know, we're all dehydrated, so we're all going to drink. You know, uh, half a gallon of water at least a day. That would be really good. And um, and um, I, I guess you know the other thing is you know, stress. Stress really is an immune destroyer. So so what we'll do is um, everybody make a list of all the people that you hate that have done you wrong that you're all upset about. Make a list of them and then forgive them. Let's try that for a month and see what happens. I mean, can you imagine uh, something like that coming? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that have been cool? Wouldn't this mean that the <laughs> meat processing industrial complex would collude with the high fructose <laughs> corn, corn syrup industrial complex and everything else in government that's made it so that that, that bureaucrat would never say that? Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean the the system. When people say, "Look, you know what you do seems so so simple and elegant, and why don't other people do this? You know, actually grow earthworms and soil and and nutrient density and all this." Because if everybody did what we did, it would completely invert the power, position, prestige, and profits of the entire food and farm in sector. That's a big ship to turn around. Yeah. So can we find your events and your forthcoming book at Polyface Farm? Yes. What's what's the uh, po- Polyface Farms, uh, P O L Y. If you put in P O L Y, it'll probably pop on up. Uh, Polyface Farms, and we have a, a very comprehensive website. Um, you know, I've written uh, this will be book number sixteen. So if you like this and you want more of it, you know, you can get. Of course, you can get them at Amazon too. But we make more money if you get them from us. Disentangle them from Amazon. That's fine too. Uh, but but anyway, um, you know, it, it has where I'll be speaking. I travel a lot and do a lot of of uh, 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 we call it speechifying, um, 
and and our our gatherings, our farm tours, all the things that we're doing, and you can order um, order food from us. You know, if you if if, if you've never tried uh, truly, um, you know, uh, alternative nutrient dense stuff, uh, try it. And then and 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 if it convinces you, then go look for your local farmer. Um, but we you know we ship we ship nationwide, and we're glad to glad to help. We push on the consumer end to force Washington to do something better. Absolutely. You know, you know, that is such a great point that all these things that we've discussed could all be eliminated if people defunded the monopolies. You don't have to you don't have to buy the monopolistic food. There are I, I run into them. I mean, there are thousands of farmers just like me all over the country that are desperate for one more customer, two more customers. Farmers who have started down this path and 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 they're still they're still commuting to town every day because they don't have enough sales to actually farm full time. You the consumer can be the facilitator. You be the catalyst, the facil- the cheerleader that enables that guy or gal to quit their town job, stay on the farm full time and and do their dream full time. You know, uh, why why not enable that to happen? So you know, that doesn't require an agency. It doesn't require uh, litigation. It doesn't require an enforcement arm. All we need to do is defund what we don't like and fund what we do. It's that simple. And let Adam Smith's hand of the market win. We're going to leave it there. Thank you, Joel. Thank you. That's a good closer. <laughs> Thanks for watching. If you liked the conversation, make sure to like the video subscribe, and also ring the bell for notifications. And if you want to know more about Free the People, go to freethepeople.org.